Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Rometha, for joining in. It's a very special day for us on the Network Capital School to welcome a dear friend um, with an, a distinguished career from being a TED fellow to a Harvard Kennedy graduate uh, to an upcoming author and a wide range of things. So you've donned many hats, Rometha. People have gone through your TED talk. They, they're familiar with uh, what you've done. But it's always interesting if you can tell us in your own words, like, you know, a bit about yourself. How do you like to be identified? So I find that the most difficult question to ever have when someone says, what do you do or who are you? Um, and it's because of the same thing. Like you, I wear so many different hats because of my different interests. So I think um, at the beginning, I always say that I'm a multi-potentialite. And that basically is a category of people who have different aptitudes of different things and interests, but they just don't lose interest. So you just continue doing different things at the same time. Um, I am a woman from Oman. I um, grew up loving um, soccer or football. Um, I, uh, at the beginning of my, of my upbringing, I actually thought that I could pursue a career in professional football, but unfortunately that didn't work out. So I kind of moved towards the direction of marine sciences and the environment because that was also something that I was very interested in doing. Um, and unfortunately at the time that I uh, graduated from high school, there weren't programs locally here. So I kind of pursued my education abroad in the Netherlands and graduated with a degree in marine sciences and environmental sciences. And then kind of, um, maneuvered my way throughout. Uh, I came back to Oman and kind of worked on that um, aspect of things, but also still kind of had a passion for football. Uh, so I ended up kind of venturing in radio to talk about the sport because I loved it so much. So I had two kind of parallel careers at the same time, pursuing policies when it came to the environment with the government, as well as advising various big me mega projects that were happening. But at the same time, talking about soccer and women in soccer and that kind of spiraled into a big social program where we were highlighting different uh, women that were actually doing amazing things in different aspects of life so that kind of spiraled into something bigger and I kind of um, learned public speaking from there and that's when I think doing so many things at once you tend to ask yourself as well what do you what's your message? What is the message that you want people to remember you by? And that was very difficult for me because people tend to really disconnect myself. So I disconnected myself. So some people really knew me professionally as this environmentalist, but a lot of people didn't know that I was in radio as well. And, or they assumed that there were two different personalities and two different people called Rumetha. Um, and it was a question that I asked myself, how do I combine all of these into one? And it wasn't until um, me finding out uh, the Project Drawdown talk that I actually highlighted in my TED talk, where it talked about climate and women and how educating and empowering women and girls is actually the single most important thing that you could do for the climate that actually brought in all of this into perspective. And I was like, I actually am doing all of these things that can all fit into one umbrella. And I can just pursue that like women empowerment and climate together and just have people remember that message. If anything, I want people to remember that if you empower your little girl today or your niece or your, or your grandchildren in the future, it's because you want a better life for them in the future for the climate as well. And making sure that we work together holistically to kind of bring this down. So yeah, that, that's me in a nutshell, very, very quickly and very short. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and something that I must add as well is I love travel. So I've been to uh, various, I'm, I, I don't know, I can't be sure that I've been to everyone's country in the call, uh, but I've been to 75 countries so far. And I just actually came back from Spain yesterday. Um, so wow. super excited to hear Q and A's and discuss how things actually, how all of these actually brought into perspective the message of how you could shape your career as well. So Rometha, that makes it two of us. Even I love uh, traveling and I've been near about the number of countries you've been to. I'm off to Sp uh, Italy after oh, our cool. summer school ends. So we'll, we'll exchange notes on it. But broadly, you know, everyone in this particular school, uh, they are, we are 
trying to build our category of one, like, you know, something that we do uniquely. Um, the students come from various age groups. One question that I often hear from students is that I'm confused about what I want to do. Like, am I a football analyst? Am I a radio star? Am I a writer? Am I a policy graduate? Am I all of them? How, sh how did you think about it when you were in school? And what advice you wish somebody gave you when you were in school? Wow. Um, so I would actually say that I, uh, and to this day, I think it was a good thing that I followed was never say no to any opportunity that comes your way. Um, I'm a total believer that I don't want to have the what if. And the main reason behind that is during high school, I had a lot of opportunities that came my way and really went to the wrong people to give me advice because they had no idea. And I turned down a lot of um, like pursuing education abroad, for instance, while I was in high school and so on. Opportunities that kind of were thrown on my lap that I should have taken advantage of, but I didn't. Um, so I ended up being, being a big believer that if an opportunity comes my way, there's always room to say no later. So, and that actually really served um, my purpose very well. Um, and I, I need to share this as well. So a big purpose of mine is to actually, uh, for me to make an impact in the world that people remember my name. That's, I mean, that's the dream. Uh, I remember ever since I was in school, I would actually daydream of the time that someone would actually call my name because I did something remarkable to the human race. And that was actually a big driver for me. Um, and that's, so I, I would actually say, um, if you're confused, um, we all are confused throughout life and confusion is part of you growing and kind of figuring out your story as well. Um, you can do as much as you want. If you're really passionate about it, I would say let passion really drive what you do. Um, and then the story will weave in very well. I mean, you will actually find a way that you can actually weave in all the characteristics of what you're doing together because that actually makes you unique. Your story is your story and it's very different than someone else's story. You're, you can have siblings in the house and everyone has a different trajectory of life. And that's because of what they chose to actually take in and what they chose to actually make as part of themselves and their character. So I would say embrace um, opportunities that come your way. Um, another thing is don't ever, imposter syndrome is there. Um, don't question yourself always happens, but always remind yourself of what your purpose is. And in the long run, you will find the perfect puzzle that actually fits in everything on all elements that you're working on. Can you tell us a bit more about the imposter syndrome and students, please start thinking of your questions because uh, every few minutes I'm going to stop, take questions from you and then continue the conversation. So yes, Rumeta. So I'll give you a Sorry, oh, sorry. A, I'm saying you already have a few questions, Utkarsh. Whenever you want to stop, uh, we can. Yeah, it. after this, uh, we'll we'll pause. Yes. Um. So, imposter syndrome. I'll actually give you a very recent example. So, I actually went to Spain for uh, a political forum where they were bringing people from the Arabian Peninsula region to talk about the Yemen issue and the war, and I really felt like I did not fit in because everyone was such an expert in politics and that's not me, I'm not a politician. So it, it took a while for me to kind of find my groove. And that's something that's very normal uh, to question yourself. But um, how I kind of went about it was ask myself, well, I was put in this place, I am here for a reason because whoever, was, whoever invited me actually saw potential in or saw a reason to, for me to be there. And it took a while for me to kind of regroup and figure out how, what was the messaging for me. Uh, and for me, it was basically, I am here to speak for the climate and environment because nobody else on the table is speaking about it. So that's my message. And that's something that I am good at that nobody else, um, that was my assumption, that nobody else actually knows more than me. And I swear, as soon as I opened my mouth and brought this topic about, the entire narrative changed, the entire framing of the issue changed because that was a collective issue that everyone actually came together and said, yeah, this is not something that's threatening. This is something that we can actually all work together and it wouldn't cause any issues of us not coming together to solve this issue of the future. So I think imposter syndrome is something that it will always be there, I think for me. Um, and maybe it's because you, 
for a lot of us who are looking for their category of one, we're so uh, high achievers in the things that we do that we tend to kind of not really follow the normal trajectory of you have X amount of experience in order for you to be in the decision-making table. So that's normal, but it's always important for you to kind of figure out what narrative you want. What is your story and what was your purpose and how do you bring that unique self to the conversation? And that always kind of calms down my syndrome and I find myself, yeah. okay, I am in the right position and in the right time as well to be there. I love this answer so much, uh, Rumetha, because uh, I, uh, you approached it and framed the issue as something greater than yourself. And then it didn't become whether you are feeling like an imposter or not. You felt that, okay, the climate change issue is so much bigger than my perhaps being scared of not being an expert in politics. And then, you know, you, you reached within, looked at what makes you unique, and then, you know, the stage was yours. And I think that is something that people can really use uh, whenever they are grappling with uh, the imposter syndrome, I think. So really well explained. Let me pause for some time and take questions from the students, Rumetha, and then we'll, sure. we'll carry on with the conversation. So Varya, how do you want to do this? Yeah, we can start with Shorya and then anyone else, if you have a question, raise your hand. Yeah. Based on what Rumetha has said so far. Okay, so I guess it's kind of late to ask this, but did you actually like try out for a career in soccer or did you like, well, not try out and thought that you wouldn't make it or something like that or you didn't have the skills? Um, so I actually did try out. Unfortunately for us, we, uh, I live in a country where it's very male dominated and women's sports is not something that uh, is supported. So I was stopped in my tracks right, right before I actually pursued it. So just to kind of give you context, I ended up making it in the under 17 national team, but the team never actually competed internationally because it was shut down immediately. Um, we, as a result of that passion though, even though I didn't end up professionally pursuing it, I ended up coming back and lobbying very hard with a group of friends of mine who are all part of the team to see how we could actually have a national football team. And only recently we actually had the first, um, um, I'm trying to find the name in English, the first uh, championship for women soccer teams in the country. So it, it was a long time coming, but I did try to pursue it with the level that I could. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, another one, I guess, based on what, uh, based on your answer. So, do you think, in some way, your your team being rejected to play was the thing that led you to, um, like this career in feminism and talking about women careers in football, or were you planning to pursue it even before? Um, I think that actually was very timely. That rejection actually fueled a lot of my stances in a lot of things when it comes to women's empowerment. Um, you hit the nail on the head. That was actually the beginning, the fuel that actually pushed a lot of my friends and myself to actually pursue that line of work and just talk um, and magnify our voice for women. So yes, that was actually the beginning, but there were other instances and other scenarios that happened throughout my life that actually just made me even more of a feminist and you're like you know what I, this is it's time that we speak about it it's time that we make it a bigger issue than it currently uh, is thought of yeah thanks Rumetha and thank you Shorya Advet you can go ahead um, hi. Uh, so I want to ask, how do you deal with rejection? I know you talked about imposter syndrome and how to not fall for it. Just kind of like failing yourself before it happens. But um, like in the case of soccer, I know you just talked about it, but it, how do you deal with rejection or failure in general? Um, it's a tough question, but throughout life, I realized that you need to have a, you need to speak about, you need to talk about it. You need to really vent out on why you feel that you were rejected. Um, uh, most of the time we internalize these issues and it becomes something bigger than it usually is. Um, and I would say the most important thing when you actually go through the downs of life, including rejection, you should have a strong support system with you. Uh, be it your friends, be it your family that really understand 
the work, the hard work that you really put in for that and why this rejection is such a big deal for you. Like some rejections are fine, but there's some that you really worked hard for and it just didn't pan out. So I think um, why I say the support system is important, they usually give you perspectives that you really didn't think about. Um, we tend to be really hard on ourselves because we're always self-critical as high achievers as well. So it's always good to kind of have the other voice telling you the other aspects that you might have not realized. And there's, and it's always good. I have my mom, the, my mom is basically the one that actually calms me down. And then I have my friends who actually kind of tell me the other, they kind of analyze it in the other way of, maybe it's because that organization or whatnot is because of this, or they are having financial trouble, something like that. So they give you other reasonable and pragmatic excuses. But I think um, having someone to calm you down and letting you know that it's not the end of the world and there's always a second time and next opportunity that comes your way is always important. So that would be the two things I would say. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome. Great, Utkash, I think we can go ahead and have a small check-in maybe 10 minutes later. Sounds good. So uh, Rumetha, um, I wanted to ask, how did you become a powerful public speaker? I would imagine uh, English may not be your native language, but uh, um, tell us how does one become better at anything and how did you become better at public speaking? Today, you're of course a world-class speaker, but uh, I know it wasn't uh, a straightforward journey. Yeah, um, so I would say practice makes perfect. Um, for a lot of people, they don't know that I was actually an introvert by nature, um, by circumstance, not really by nature. Um, so I'm the first of my first grandchild and first child of my family. So I really didn't have like cousins and whatnot who are my age that I could deal with. So I ended, I was very much of an introverted character. I found out that I was. I was okay with speaking in public when I uh, ventured into radio actually. Um, and for me, I was thinking of it, oh, radio, not many people can, I can't look at people, but I can speak. So maybe mm. that helped out a lot. Um, so when I ventured into radio, um, I started obviously in Arabic um, and that didn't, well, because we were talking about soccer, there was a lot of uh, pressure, uh, political and public pressure that actually made me switch to English. Um, and I, at that point, I, I was very lucky to have um, a mentor who was the morning show host, um, who realized it was like, there's a lot of things that you're actually doing wrong. Um, so for instance, for a lot of us, we tend to, we are told to speak louder or speak, project louder and clearer. And what ended up happening was for me, I was screaming without me knowing, obviously. And he was like, no, that's, that's very natural and that's very normal for a lot of people. They think increasing the volume is how you project, but it's not the way that you actually do things. So he kept on coaching me um, from time to time, like basically how you actually pronounce words, how you make sure that uh, a rule of thumb, and this is very um, helpful for a lot of you, is um, science actually has proven that people's, people's um, understanding of words is basically the most ideal is four words at a time. So you speak for four words and then you pause for a bit and then you continue. And that actually, that actually helps you in pacing yourself as well and not speaking too fast in making sure that you are actually it's literally pronouncing every word properly um, so that actually is a rule of thumb that I've used uh, very much so. And also another thing that was very useful was to imagine that you were speaking to that one person and mm -hmm. personalize it and not speak to all. Um, if you personalize it, the person that you speak to actually thinks that you're speaking to them, even if it's a mass. And that was very useful. So at the beginning, when I was being coached, I had a little doll that I would put in front of me and speak to it. Because in radio, you are in a room and you don't see anybody. So you have to kind of have that human element um, to it as well. I think how you become good at anything is basically persevering and practicing it and making sure that you really are, you really want to do it. Um, 
And that comes in naturally after a while. Like at the beginning, it becomes a chore. It, it, it really is a chore. Like, oh, I need to do this because I don't want to miss out on um, the time or the, the length that I actually practice. But after a while, it becomes very natural. Uh, you tend to really love it and it becomes second nature. So at the beginning, I used to be very nervous. And now I don't have nerves because I'm so used to it. So getting used to someone is something um, and practicing it is the way to excel in anything, I would say. And there's a book actually that talks about 10,000 hours to be a yes. master of everything. I truly believe in that. Like if the more time you actually put into something, the more you become masterful in the thing that you actually do. Yeah. I mean, those 10,000 rules, there's been a lot written and debated about it, but just generally, I think deliberate practice, you as a sportswoman, and uh, you would know that if you want to become better at anything, uh, you want to have a feedback loop with yeah. the feedback provider. Like, look at what you're not doing well and try and increase it a bit by a bit more, compound yourself to success. And I also loved what you said about uh, speaking to one person. Interestingly, yesterday we were having a writing class in the Network Capital Summer School. And we also practice the same thing for writing. If you try and write something for everybody in the world, it'll, it'll turn out to be very generic. But if you really focus on somebody, and then it can have the scale. Um, so really resonated with me. Tell me, um, Many people here have to give TED Talks or dream of giving TED Talks. You have given a very popular TED Talk recently. How does one prepare for a talk like this? Every student here will be given a, giving a mini TED Talk before graduation. So tell us, walk us through the process. Give us the tips. Give us the mindset. How do you go? Uh, okay, so the first thing that... Um, so I'll just walk you through the process of uh, how I actually ended up doing the TED Talk was I was actually approached and told, well, there's Earth Day coming and we're wondering if you were interested to kind of speak about, about what you do during that day. It was very, so I, I am not a traditional TED speaker. I didn't have months in advance to prepare. I, I literally had two weeks to prepare for my talk. And the first thing that you do is basically sit and brainstorm what exactly is the message that you want to share with the world. What is that mm -hmm. nugget that, if anything, what is that nugget that you want people to actually walk out from your talk with? Once you, and that's kind of a process. Like it takes, it took sleepless nights for me to figure out exactly what I wanted people to kind of come out with. Um, and once you kind of nail down that message, now you build your narrative around it. Um, and you need to kind of figure out what sort of statistics you want to kind of highlight. What is your personal story? What is your, what is of your person that you want to kind of bring into the story as hmm. well. And what is the future? What is it that you actually want as a call to action as well? Um, and that basically for me, it was a five minute talk, five to six minute talk, five minutes if we didn't take into account the pauses that I did. Um, so that's around 500 words. And basically you draft your entire thing in 500 words and kind of go through iterations. I had a few people look into it, including the TED team to kind of figure out what were the things that needed corrections, what actually, what word did I need to change to actually have it more stand out, have the talk or the sentence stand out more. Uh, once you finish with that, that's when it's the time for you to actually prepare how you are actually going to be projecting and how you're actually going to be speaking. And that took time as well, um, like figuring out which sentence actually wanted, needed an extra pause for dramatic effect, which one needed you to actually speak with passion, which one needed you to actually really deal with your feelings. Like for instance, I um, digged really deep when I was talking about the avalanche that I went through. Um, mm. And so that what were the elements and what are the, how animated should you be? Um, and once you do that, I really suggest that you record yourself. That's the best way to actually see how you actually do it. Um, and it's very easy. I, I mean, you record yourself standing, using your laptop like I have now. You could use, I'm on uh, Apple, so you could use QuickTime actually to record your, yourself. Um, and then you figure out what are the things that you actually want to correct. Once you have that in place, that's the time to memorize your talk or your speech. 
and then it's time to dress up and do your talk. Um, but I would say practice it more than once. Figure out how like different tones, um, see which tone actually works for you. Do you want it to be an optimistic tone? Do you want it a doom and gloom? It really depends as well on what your message is. So that's how you actually come up with a TED talk at the end and for people to actually watch it. Would you recommend writing your talk first before practicing? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I said, like 500 words, write it down. You have five, it basically if it's five minutes, by default, if it's one minute, keep it, keep it at 100 words. If it's two minutes, keep it at 200 words that, that way. Um, write it down, clarify it, have people look at it to give you feedback on it. Once you're really sure of it, that's when you actually start um, practicing it while reading it. Um, easier way to actually, um, I did mention something about recording, right? So yeah. what I used to do is not memorize the talk before I, I did, I, mem I not memorize it before I finalized it. So what you do is basically there are apps on or websites on uh, Google where you could actually teleprompt your entire yeah. talk. So you could just use the teleprompter and see how the flow of the talk is. Is it too long? Is it too short? Once you have those all nailed down, that's when you actually memorize the talk. Got it, got it, great. We have a couple of questions, but before I take them, just uh, any thoughts on stage fear? Have you ever had stage fear or have you ever struggled to uh, condense what you wanna say in 500 words or X number of words? If yes, any ideas how students can get better? And then Ananya and Shorya, you can ask your questions. Okay, so I'll start off with the condensing. I think the most important thing is to, um, we tend naturally to share as much as we want because it's such an important talk. But when you actually go through the talk and have someone go through it, they can actually realize and tell you where it's lengthy or where your message is repetitive. And most of the time we don't tend to see that because we're very biased to what we want to share. So it's always good to have someone else tell you, you can actually remove these words or remove these sentences because it's, it's not necessary. You could say all of this in one sentence, or it's just basically how you structure it. Um, so I've, that's always good to actually have someone else go through it, but also be very honest with yourself and just remove stuff that are fluff. Um, we, mm. There are a lot of fluff words that we tend to use. Just remove it, make it very simple, basic to normal people. Um, as a scientist or as someone who's an engineer or someone is this, we tend to use words that are very normal in our line of work, but it's not necessarily useful for people who are the general public. So dumb it down as much as you can, because that's the way to actually do it. You don't need to use cliche words or marketing words to um, market your company or market the cause that you're actually working on. Um, so that's how you can easily condense things. In terms of stage fright, um, what I found very useful, uh, a rule of thumb, don't over drink water because you tend to um, drown in your own spit. And I say it uh, <laughs> because I've gone through it. <laughs> I've gone through, uh, I'll just give you an example. I've gone through uh, a time where I actually stood in front of 5,000 people. And because I was so nervous, this was the first time that I had such a big mass of people. I overdrank so much water because I was so nervous because my throat was dry. By the time I was there, I just couldn't have a few words, but like drown literally in my spit and not finish the word and just swallow. <laughs> so just be moderate, moderate that. Um, and another thing is, like I said, um, speak to one person. If you pick a person in your audience and most of the time it's someone who actually nods and it's very engaging, you could actually see them and catch them the moment you walk into a room, just lock there. Whenever you feel like you're lost, you're going around, just go back to that person. That person is a stranger, but will give you assurance because they're so interested in what you're saying. And that really calms your nerves down. And what I realized that's the first two, like 30 seconds, and then you're fine. Um, so always remind yourself that you got it. You have a really important message to share and that People are interested. Whoever is there in your room is very interested in hearing what you have to say and just lock to that one person. That's your anchor, basically. Awesome. Uh, Ananya, uh, questions? Yes. So as women of color, it is that much more difficult for one to vocalize their opinions. 
and get people to respect them. How did you overcome this? Um, I would say I would never keep that as a barrier. If anything, I use that to my advantage. Um, uh, for a lot of people who tend to, and I'm assuming this is in a situation where you're having a debate. Um, I don't know what situation you were thinking of, but if I were imagining I'm having a situation where I'm in a debate with someone and someone is dumbing it down because of who I am, I actually use that in the other way around and say, well, I am a woman of color or I come from this and I've gone through this, this, this. I doubt that you actually went through that and kind of reiterate my point again. Um, it's always good to use the authority that you have in anything, even in public speaking, in, uh, in any message that you share, you always utilize the type of authority that you have or the experience that you have in order for you to kind of reiterate the message that you know what you're talking about. Um, for most of the time, especially women, and it's not only women of color, especially women in general, we tend to be mansplained a lot. So it's a matter of like going back and saying, no, I know exactly what you're talking about and you don't need to explain that because this is what I'm telling you based on my experience, X, Y, and Z is what I am um, explaining it to basically. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Great, thanks Ananya. Um, Maria, back to you. Yeah, sure, we can get go ahead with your question. Actually, if like we could go ahead with advance first, I'm still like formulating my question because I don't have the exact word yet. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll come back. Um, hi. Uh, sorry. I think my network bandwidth is a little bit low. I'm not sure, um, but I'll try and ask anyway. Um, so you talked a little bit about choosing what to highlight, um, you know, statistics, emotions, tones, stuff like that. Um, do you have a certain rule of thumb? Um, I know you just talked on Enya about like um, exercising the authority that you have um, about your personal experiences. Do you somewhat, how do you balance uh, statistics versus personal anecdotes? Um, okay, when, so when trying to argue. Okay, so in public speaking in general, there's a, um, I don't know if you, you've been taught this, um, there's something called ethos, logos, and pathos. So basically, uh, in your talk or even in your in your whatever you're writing you need to have these three elements and basically ethos is it talks about the credibility or the trust how do you build the credibility and trust with the person that's actually listening to you um, so um, and that's where your authority kind of comes into play um, in terms of logos that's the logic what are the facts what's the research what's the proof that whatever you're talking about is important now and it's necessary now and then you have the emotion, the pathos. Uh, what are the values and what are the emotions that kind of connect all of this together? In general, all um, that's the rule of thumb that I tend to use and a lot of people tend to use. So make sure you have all of these three elements together in terms of what actually needs to be more than the other. It really depends on you and what sort of talk, like I said, what sort of tone you're planning on sharing, what sort of uh, message you want to share is it really a scientific um, proof that like 70% of X, Y, and Z is this? Is that the message? So it really depends what the mix is, really depends on you and who you are and what you're planning on sharing with the world. Excellent. Uh, any questions on this segment? If yes, please ask them now. Yeah. And while, uh, yeah, please go ahead, Valeria. Yeah, Avisha, you can go ahead and then Shoya, we can come to you. Hi, so I wanted to ask that how to make the talk more interesting, like when you're starting the talk, you just can't directly um, tell them, tell the listeners the message that you want to convey. So like, is there a proper format through which you can convey indirectly the message that you want to give and engage them in the speech and make the speech more interesting? I would actually have to disagree with you with the thing that you can't start off with a message. The most important thing is you want to engage someone and the person who's listening to you from the beginning on why this is interesting. Um, people kind of go about it a different way. Some people tell the story of their life. Like for instance, when I was young, I went through this and that thing is the big thing that kind of connects everything to the end. Uh, some people start with statistics. So it really depends on again, the message, but what exactly is that nugget that you want people to kind of get out of and use that in the beginning of your formulation of your talk. Not necessarily the big message. 
but basically where you need to kind of tell people where you're leading them to. And that needs to stand out from the beginning or else nobody's interested in listening to your talk if they don't understand why they're listening to you. So that's the way that you actually make it interesting. Like you tie in what your big message is in the beginning and then you end it with that big bang as well and that actual message as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Shari, are you ready now? Yeah, thanks. Um, so my question, I guess it's a little late for this one as well, but while you were um, a part of the radio, you said because of pressure, political and otherwise, you turned to English. If it hadn't been there, do you think you would have still been in Arabic? Yes, definitely, most sure. Um, Arabic is our native language, so that's where you hit the bigger masses than English. Um, uh, basically in, in Oman, but English gives you the opportunity as well to go internationally, which I ended up doing. So there's always, um, there's always, I would say hurdles in life. And it's a matter of you kind of looking into the perspective of what do you want in the end and how do you actually are, how are you projecting your purpose and message through that? So I never let that be something that actually stopped me. In fact, it just made me change my vision to something bigger. But to be honest, yeah, I would have been in Arabic and mostly uh, venturing to English eventually. Yeah, speaking multiple languages can be uh, a, a huge advantage, especially in today's world. Um, tell me, uh, Rumetha, when you were uh, doing all of these things, like still, you know, there are multiple projects. It seems like you're not having one career, but a portfolio of careers speaker, writer, thinker, activist, policy person, what have you. Um, what does a day in your life really look like? And how do you think of time management or energy management? What advice do you have for our students? So time management has been a really, really big part of my life. And this is how basically I govern a lot of the things that I do. Um, I my Bible is basically my Google calendar <laughs> that has every single thing that I have to do or want to do throughout the day. Um, what I find um, very useful or important is to actually figure out from the beginning, where do you want to kind of spend the most of your time? Um, and what do you want to spend the most of your time doing based on the projects that you have, right? So for instance, I have the book that we uh, talked about a bit. I'm in the process of writing a children's book um, and that has been something that I actually really enjoy doing in the weekend. So whenever I am free, that, like it really takes you into a creative world. And that's how I kind of operate when it comes to writing books. Mm. So um, I allocate that for the weekend because it's just something fun and it doesn't feel like work uh, that you do. But the other stuff, like the policy stuff, um, the uh, fellowships that I am doing, my actual work that I'm doing is all something that I kind of um, strategize from the beginning of the month. And so I kind of go through it every month and see how much time I want to give e each day for each project. Um, and basically really scheduling time on my Google calendar. Like I'm giving this time and I'll book myself somewhere in a coffee shop or in an office to kind of finish this off. And once you actually have that, it's very easy uh, for you to actually go about and achieve and hit those milestones that you want to do. What I find, and I find it very easy for me as well to actually say no whenever something comes up because I can easily say, let me check my calendar. I'm sorry, I don't have time. Um, and that allows me to not overbook myself to do so many things all at once, which is always an issue with uh, high achievers and people who want to kind of create their category of one. You tend to have a lot of things that come to you and you say, yes, yeah, let me do this. And then there's conflicting commitments that you end up uh, having to say no to one. So that kind of allows you to manage your time. In addition to that, in terms of energy management, um, my source of rejuvenating energy is alone time. So I really do schedule time to just be alone and read a book or just walk. Uh, music, uh, I actually even have my um, speaker. Like music is really a really therapeutic thing for me. So I really just take time, have music, be alone or walk around and just rejuvenate. Um, and this is part of my exercise or workout. 
Um, so that is something that I allocate at least an hour a day after dinner to do. And when I really feel that I'm really burnt out and exhausted, that's a time that I really take where I spend time with family or ask to go hiking or do something that's out of the ordinary that takes me out of that um, um, setting basically. And no phones. So I just don't take my phone <laughs> whenever I go hiking or picnicking because I really, I really feel like technology as well, even though it's been very useful, has been the source of anxiety sometimes. And that's the way that you can um, kind of cut off for a while and just have that energy rejuven rejuvenated. Uh, so this is how I actually do it. Google Calendar has been very useful to even schedule my, my rest times. Like, okay, now you need to kind of rest and do something. And I actually have it just say, do something fun. And then I need to figure out something fun that I need to sign up for or do. So if it's not on the calendar, it doesn't exist. I live by a similar philosophy. It needs to be on the calendar, everything. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, Rumetha, um, let's talk a bit about, uh, you know, your, uh, your college and grad school experience. Why did you decide to go to the college that you went to and then uh, to Harvard for a master's? Um, and what did you learn from that experience? The reason I ask this question is that many students are figuring out, one, should they go to college? Second, you know, why should they go to college? What can they expect to learn? And uh, how's all of that changing in the pandemic era, if you have any thoughts on this subject? Yeah, so uh, the reason I chose the college that I ended up going, I ended up uh, studying in the Netherlands, was actually me figuring out that, but like I said, the program that I wanted to study was not available locally. Hmm. Uh, so I needed to kind of find other ways that I could actually study environmental sciences and marine sciences. Um, and kind of gain that knowledge without really forfeiting for something else that I didn't want to do. Um, mm. So I ended up really asking around um, if there were opportunities to kind of study abroad. And I was very lucky that our next door neighbor were actually Dutch. So it was just a random conversation one day and I asked about their daughters who were back in Holland and they were like, well, they're actually scholarships, I think, let me speak to my daughters and I'll come back to you. And they were like, actually, they're looking for Arab students in the university that one of the daughters was. And uh, I was very lucky enough to contact the university, go through the interview process, and they were more than happy to even offer me a scholarship to go. So that was kind of a given. I was like, I'm going, even though um, my own mother was very skeptical on the whole aspect of you going to the Netherlands and obviously some people have the reputation of the Netherlands being yeah the um, Amsterdam <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah Amsterdam um, so they were very she was very skeptical but I just said I need to go and pursue what I want to study and I was very lucky to have my dad as well who was very supportive so I ended up going um, the main reason I ended up then choosing to go to the Kennedy school was actually because in a lot of professional settings that I was working in, I would always be told, well, you don't know much about policy um, because you're a scientist. Um, let the policy work be done by the policy makers hmm. and you just give us the data and that's it. And I found it very offensive. Um, and I was like, but I actually deserve to be here and I know these policies more than you would because I have the science and the data to back it up. Um, but a lot of people just didn't, I felt like I needed to build my credibility when it came to that. Hmm. Um, and when I was literally searching for policy schools, I really didn't even have the Harvard Kennedy School in mind. I was just speaking to a friend of mine and said, well, I'm looking at policy schools at the moment. And I was thinking of the London School of Economics, actually, and, and the UK. Um, and it was like, well, Harvard also has a program that's really good. And there's a couple of people that I know that actually <coughs> have gone through it. So maybe you could ask them. And very, uh, Oman is such a small place. So everyone knows everybody. Um, and I didn't know that the two people that he was referring to are actually people that I actually know. So mm. I was like, I had no idea that you were a Harvard grad. So tell me more about the experience. And they had all glowing things to talk about it. So I was like, let me try and apply. And I got accepted and ended up going in 2019. Uh, 
and uh, 2018, sorry, and ended up graduating in the peak of the pandemic <laughs> in March, uh, May of 2020. So I, I kind of had both experiences of having it in campus and having it online in my bed in Oman. So I can tell you, um, the pandemic actually accelerated a lot of things when it comes to learning um, uh, and having access to a lot of things that you didn't have access to before because it required you to actually commute to one place in order for you to listen to a lecture, for instance, in order for you to take part in competitions, to take part in debates. And that kind of opened the door for a lot of, uh, for a lot of us, I would say, and including those who are taking part in the summer school right now to take these opportunities and, mm -hmm. and learn more and get, yeah, have more of a learning of what's happening in the world based on your interests. I would say education is important. Um, college for me is important. Um, for those who have a different point of view, um, it really depends on what they are planning on pursuing in life. Um, like I have a cousin who's a carpenter, never went to school, but he's doing very well because he went to vocational training school and learned the skills that he needed to build his business to what it is today. So it really depends on what you actually see yourself doing. And that's a question that is very difficult for a lot of people to ask themselves. Um, so where do you see yourselves in five years and 10 years? What are you doing? What car are you driving? Uh, what impact are you actually, what sort of conversations are you having with people? And I think once you have that answer, that's when you figure out exactly where your path in life is going to be. Um, but I would say the experience um, like for me being in the Netherlands was such a big experience because it was the first time that I actually was out of the comfort of family and friends. I was alone. I learned a lot to be independent with myself. I learned a lot of skills that, including time management, that if I didn't learn at that point in time, I don't think I would have ever learned it uh, in any other time um, mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, I'll give you an example of me being in, uh, in undergrad, I used to go to school, go to college to do my studies, and then I signed up for a research position with the university to work on a few things, and then signed up with other so extracurricular activities that happened in campus. So you needed to really time manage yourself to be able to participate in all of these equally and be the student that you actually aspire to be a top student. So if I didn't know how to kind of manage that from the beginning, I don't think I would be able to use the Google Calendar now to manage my time and pursue all these passions that I had. So I think it's like you need that foundation to really find yourself and figure out what who you are. Um, and education was the way for me. College was the way that I actually found out a lot about who I was away from the comfort of being at home and hmm. being told by my parents that I am this well maybe I didn't believe that I was so yeah yeah so students please uh, get your questions ready uh, Rumetha in the summer school we have uh, a section on critical thinking like how should you think say things about climate change gender politics international relations pandemic people are expected to have a uh, strong um, research back to hopefully sensible opinions on various amounts of things. Um, how, have you, how do you go about forming an opinion on an issue? And how do you disagree with people if and when you have to? Mm -hmm. In a very good question. I, never, I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question. <laughs> um, how I formulate an opinion, I would say um, it, it really is dependent on what I know about the topic. Um, what I generally know about the topic before researching it. So hmm. I would formulate an opinion based on what I've heard, based on whatever I've been fed off by media and so on. But then I find it very important for me to kind of read more about it. So I would search more about it, understand more. Um, and why it's important for me to think this way and what is the op opposing way of thinking of it. Um, and when I actually go through these debates, I go through them a lot with, um, I'm very blessed to have friends from different spectrums of life and, and thinking. So we, I have a friend who is completely a climate denier, but we're still friends. And it's always <laughs> interesting to have these conversations with them. 
like he believes that earth is flat. So like, it's such a really intense conversations that we tend to have, but it has really taught me how to really take their perspective as well. Like taking perspectives and hearing what they say before going defensive and saying that you are wrong. I mean, they have a right to have that opinion. And if anything, you want to change someone's opinion, you need to really understand what their perspective is and how, if you're really listening to what they're saying or not. Um, but at the end of the day, we we'll always end up agreeing, uh, agreeing to disagree and having this conversation at a later time. Um, but I think it's always important to kind of um, acknowledge that there are people who are totally against the opinion that you have and that this should not never be a deal breaker. Uh, this should be a point where you embrace the uncomfortableness that this actually brings in because when you embrace it, that's when you are actually making progress to either one, either you being agree, you agreeing to the position or the mm. other way around that you're actually taking them to their position as well. Um, just ignoring it and saying that nothing is happening. There's always point of tension there that will never be solved. So I think it's always important to continue having discussions, no matter how uncomfortable they are. Yeah. And I think uh, I love this quote when somebody said that uh, your success in life comes down to the number of difficult conversations you're willing to have. Yeah. And I think it's so important to not push things under the rug. And uh, this having an opinion is really important on NC. Uh, we say that you should have an opinion on something where, of course, you've logically thought this through and you know the other side's argument, at least as well as yours, if not better. Because you can't argue something from both sides. Your uh, knowledge might be limited. So I thought that uh, that was an interesting debate technique as well as a writing, thinking topic. I know we're coming towards the end of the session. Let me see if the students have the last few questions. And then uh, I, I have just a uh, rapid fire uh, five minutes and then we can wrap it up. Okay. Varya, do we have any questions for Rumetha right now? We do. Um, so we can start with Arush and take the others as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, my question is, if football turned out to be your career professionally, how do you think it would affect your young leadership for environment, actions for the feminine cause, and also your work with economic diversification? Oh, wow. Ah. Tough. I think I think I come from a family that have would have re still really pushed me to pursue an education in terms of having an undergraduate degree. Um, I might end up still doing, <laughs> still pursuing the environment. Um, but how things would have unraveled after that, I would not know uh, because if I'm thinking really big as I was before, um, my assumption is I'm still pursuing soccer and maybe I was a, I'm a coach now to, to a big team that is somewhere in the world. Um, so I would not know. I know that my convictions when it comes to being a feminist and pushing the women's agenda would not have stopped for sure. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Um, um, Shore, would you like to go ahead? Okay, so I have, I think, two questions for you. One of them is about, the, like, for, for example, I have a dream of giving a TED Talk before I actually turn 18. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, whenever, like, I've given, I've spoken in public before, and whenever I try to prepare my speech, what happens is I start rambling on and on, and, like, a five-minute speech turns into, like, a 10 or like 13 minute speech. And after a while I realized that I need to make it concise, but I've written like important points and I don't know where to cut out of the speech. So like, do you have any pointers for that? Yeah, so um, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning. What What's the message that you want to share with the world? What's the message that you want the audience to understand? And build like before even writing your speech, have bullet points of the most important things that you want them to know, you know? What are the facts that you want? What is the message that you want? What's the emotion that you wanna share? Once you have that all, these are the most important things. Anything else that kind of veers off to explain those points and explain and explain, you can just cut off. Like if these three, four key things are there, you can cut off a lot of the other chunk uh, that you are actually rambling on. 
Um, and it's always, it's always good to actually have someone else kind of go through it for them to kind of tell you where you're actually going on a tangent rather than actually focusing on your point. Um, for a lot of us, we tend to over explain ourselves because we want someone to understand. But if you actually focus on those four main points that you want and draft it in the most simple way possible for the normal human being to understand, then there you have it. You have your five minute speech. You don't need to have a 10 minute speech explaining what your five minute speech would have been, you know? Super yeah, helpful. I get it. Okay. And that's not like hopefully we see your TED talk. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Um, okay, and then another one for me would be, what would, in your perspective, be your greatest achievement in, like, for example, the field of women empowerment, in the field of economics, uh, not economics, but environmental sciences? I would say the biggest one at the moment is what you guys know, um, it, having a TED Talk that's almost at a million views. Um, that was something that I never, that came uh, as a result of something that I really need, didn't dream of. Um, another personal, personal achievement to me uh, is being able to actually step foot on the South Pole and becoming the youngest person in my country to do so. Um, that's something that's very personal because it came as a result of a challenge that my grandfather actually uh, told me that I wasn't able to do it because I was a woman. And that turned into a bet where he said, if I end up going there, he would admit that women were better. And he's a chief, tri he's a tribe chief. So if it comes from him, then the entire tribe would actually believe him, right? So it was a very emotional and very, uh, yeah, it's something that I really still cherish to my heart today. Yeah. More power to you. Thank you. Um, we have one final question from Rajsi. He sent it to me in the chat because he has some tech issues, which is um, how do you attempt to answer questions that you don't know the answers of? You simply admit that you don't know the answer. I think it's very important for you to show people and be vulnerable as well to say, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but uh, it depends on how the question is structured. You could say, I don't know the answer to that, but, and then pick on something that was like, if someone would ask me, what would be, are we able to achieve um, the 1.5 degrees um, mandate that we have for the Paris Agreement? I literally would not say no, because I don't know if we could, but I would pick on something and just reiterate the message that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, so yeah, simply admit it and then follow it up with something that you actually know. Yeah, admit knowing what you don't know is perhaps a sign of wisdom. So okay. I won't worry too much about it. Okay. Rumetha, this has been such a delight. Uh, we have one minute, so let's do a short rapid fire and see how much we can squeeze in. Okay. What advice would you give to your 15 year old self? Believe in yourself. Uh, what is the book that you've uh, gifted the most to friends and family? Exercising Leadership by Ron, by Ron Heifetz. Okay. Uh, what is something that you've changed your mind about recently and why? Ah, oh, wow. Um, I don't know what I've changed my mind. Oh, maybe war is not as complicated as we think. Okay. Um, and why? Why did you change your mind? What prompted you to change your mind? Um, conversations I've had with people who actually are experiencing war at the moment. Um, it's just basically to, it's a personal vendetta that people need to kind of just, uh, just remove those people and things will be fine. That's my, my opinion of, of it. <laughs> You, uh, by any standard, you're a very successful woman. Do you allocate your success to luck? hard work or a bit of both? A bit of both. Why? Um, there are a few instances where opportunities came in because of sheer luck. I was at the right, same place, right place at the right time. Um, and a lot of things that actually have happened because of hard work. Yep. Great. If you look back at your life, is there anything that you would undo or any changes you'd like to undo or 
you know, life is what it is. You're happy with it. No changes. No changes. I'm truly, be- I truly believe all the hardships that I went through actually made me who I am today. So I'm afraid if I undo something, it would change my character. Love it. Uh, leadership within adversity. And lastly, what is the one message that you have for all our students here who are listening to you, who are obviously very inspired by your journey, by your hardships and so forth? Um, people believe people who believe in the beauty of their dreams make it happen. So please, please, please don't let anybody tell you that you can't do anything because if you truly believe that you can, you definitely can. Absolutely. So well said, Rumetha. Look forward to having you back with us again uh, for this, uh, for the school which kicks off next month. More power to your book. I know it'll become a bestseller and it was such a pleasure uh, having you with us. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.